Well, Thank yeah, you. you're here. <laughs> okay, so uh, great to, well, not see you all, but at least feel uh, see you all online. Um, so the title of my talk is Understanding Intelligent Behavior Through Cognitive Skills. And this is part of uh, research in cognitive architectures. And I hope to um, explain a little bit what I intend to do with this. Um, so uh, I didn't want to give a too technical talk about cognitive architectures, but mainly to show that by using cognitive architectures, we can maybe cast a little bit of a different light on uh, yeah, how on understanding how people perform complex tasks. So to start off, um, let's look at um, an old theory by Squire and Knowlton, who tried to build a theory of memory. So they said, like, well, me we have the of course the the, the concept of memory, uh, but maybe we can split memory up in various sort of component memories. Uh, so they said like, well, maybe there's explicit memory and there's implicit memory and each of these memories we can further dissect into other memory systems. And there's a lot of neuroscience research behind this and, and also a lot of experimental, experimental results. So lots of implicit memory experiments, uh, priming experiments, classical conditioning. That's of course the, the old, oldest type of uh, experiment on this. And what I try to do is sort of say like, well, can we design experiments to discover what this, well, you could say what the systems are of memory, what the systems are in the brain. And I'm not saying that this idea is wrong, but maybe that uh, we've taken that direction a little bit too far in trying to say like, well, if we have, if we complete this tree, you could say, if we make this tree for the whole brain, maybe then we understand cognition. So that would be the left-hand side of this diagram, the way you say like, well, we, uh, we figure out all the functions and where they are in the brain. And, uh, but, the, but do we then understand intelligence and cognition? And maybe not. And maybe it's maybe it's part of it that we that we try to find out where things are in the brain and what their functions are, but we also need to think about the process, and that's sort of the right hand side here. So this is a sort of graphic representation of a Turing machine, and what's so interesting about a Turing machine is that it's hardly any system at all. Uh, it's the Turing machine is has just a, a few very simple components, but together they give you sort of universal, the power of universal computation. So that's another approach to sort of think like, well, we shouldn't really think about the system, but we should think about the process. And, and, I, I, and I don't, I'm not saying you have to make a choice here, but we have to find the balance and something and think about, well, when is a system approach useful and when is a process approach useful? So if we think about the process, then uh, we, you often see things, things about thinking about levels of abstraction. And uh, David Marr was, of course, the most may, maybe the most fa famous version of that. But there are many versions of this idea that uh, what we want to explain is some sort of behavior. So in the bird example here, we want to explain flight. And we have, you could say, some sort of implementation. We have some sort of hardware that produces flight. So in the case of a bird, it's, it's feathers. But, uh, and that's sort of Mars, Mars argument. We have to find out uh, the, what he called the algorithmic level. So the, the key explanatory level of extraction that really explains why birds can fly, but also maybe why other things can fly that don't have feathers. For example, if you have a, a, a bat, a bat doesn't have feathers, but it can still fly because it has wings that it flaps. And uh, of course, then there's airplanes that don't that don't flap, but so they they have a different algorithm, you could say, but maybe also the same principles. And a lot of the research in cognitive science has been looking at this algorithmic level, like can we find the principles? Uh, and this also has given rise to a lot of debate where people said like, no, symbols, that is the important level of explaining, uh, explaining intelligence. Or 
neural networks, that is the principal algorithmic level and the rest is implementation. So that's always like sometimes you have people say like, well, this is this is the central thing. And of course, we've in cognitive science, we've many we've seen many of these different ideas about what the algorithmic level is of intelligence. But maybe, and I think that we, we also see now that people start to realize that maybe there is no magic level of abstraction that can explain everything. Um, and even if we look at computer levels of abstraction, so computer architectures, so here, here is a, a diagram from my, when I studied computer science, I learned about computer architectures and I had a very, really great textbook and it explained how a computer is built and it had, here you can see seven levels of abstraction where each level of abstraction is explained by the level below it. And uh, so you can see here, and, and all these levels are, are essentially eventually to understanding how a computer works. So if we already need seven levels to understand a computer, why do we think three levels are enough to understand human, human intelligence? So this has been, uh, well, the focus of my research the last couple of years where I thought like, well, what would be good, what would, would be a good human intelligence cognitive architecture diagram instead of thinking about uh, three levels where we just have the brain, we have behavior and we have some intermediate level. What, what are other levels of abstraction that we can think about and how do these levels translate into one another? So here's my diagram. And this is a big diagram. Uh, so this, is, this also violates sort of the rules of presentation. You shouldn't put too much information on one slide. Uh, but I'm not going to explain all of this, but I just wanted to show you uh, sort of a general outline. And uh, what we can see here is sort of different levels of abstraction. And so I want to highlight a few of them. So here are two levels that I would associate with the ECTAR architecture. So maybe you've heard about the ECTAR ar architecture. So it's Don Anderson's theory about intelligent behavior. And what it tries to do is to try to explain how people perform tasks by creating simulators that consist of what I call operators here. So you could say primitive cognitive steps that you need to perform to carry out a task. So if you, and tasks are often in, well, especially in ECTAR's terms, often what people do in, in, in experiments, in, in psychological experiments. So maybe it's a memory task where they have to, where they have to remember things and then Ektar explains that by saying like, well, we have operations that put things in memory, that, that, that uh, recall things from memory. And if we understand the sequence of these operators, we can explain how people perform tasks. And by doing that, we can make predictions about how they perform, how, what their reaction times are and what the errors are that they make. Um, so you can say this is the, the playing ground of Actar, but there's a disadvantage, a couple of limitations to this. And that is that it has a very strong focus on tasks. So it creates a specific model for a specific task. So it doesn't really generalize the situations where people carry out multiple different tasks, but maybe also use the same principles from carrying it over from one task to another. So looking at a different level of abstraction is down here where we look at neurons and here I also show neuromorphic architecture because that's also one of the things that we're working on. So like how can you, what is the, what is, you could say very, the level of abstraction that's really close to, you could say the hardware. And uh, you can see that many people make very impressive models of uh, with using neural networks. And of course, that's also what we see in the, the enormous revolution we see now in, 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 in AI in general. Uh, but this is usually also not the best level to understand what is going on uh, on, a, on a higher level. So uh, of course, deep neural networks do fantastic things, but if we want an explanation of why they're doing certain things, then we, are, uh, we have a tough problem on our, on our hands. So here you can see, well, you could say two existing uh, architectures, Ektar and Nengo. Uh, or, or Nengo and other neural network approaches. But 
we see also see some blank spots here, and that is what I've been trying to do, fill up the blanks here. So I think we need two additional intermediate levels of abstraction to bridge the gap all the way from clusters of neurons to carrying out tasks. And um, so that two, you could say missing levels in what I would consider the way we typically think about uh, modeling cognition. And one level is the level of primitive operations. And the other is the level of skills. And the level of skills is what I'm going to talk about today. So primitive operations are all very interesting too, but not today's topic. So what do I mean by skills? Um, now one slide about prims, but I think I already explained that a little bit. So level of skills is um, that we try to find collections of mental operations that uh, perform a, use, a useful cognitive function, but it's something that is reusable. So whereas the, you could say traditional way of modeling, the modeling that Ektar does, but many other cognitive architectures as well, they built a model for a single task. So they're not really concerned with reusing part of that model because if there's another task, they build another model. But if you are interested in how knowledge carries over from one task into another, you need to say like, well, what are the components that carry over from one task to another? And therefore it is useful to look at units of, of knowledge that are larger than individual simple operations because these are very simple elementary steps, but that are smaller than complete tasks because a complete task is very hard to carry over from one, one situation to another. Um, so we define, we, that's, that's what, what we came up with the, well, the term of skill. Did someone have a question or was this just the automatic oh, no, clock? It was the clock, okay. <laughs> Means I, I already spent 50 minutes. It's good to keep track that's of that. So let, let me let me just give an example of what, what would be a good way of looking at skills, because now it's sort of an abstract idea. So here is a, a, a couple of pictures, and these are um, it, it, the, the, these are taken from something called Brain Quest. And this, these are questions for children in the age of three to five years old. So they look at this picture and they have to find to find an answer. And these are all sort of trivial questions for us, like which tank has more fish and which mother bird has six babies. Um, and if you look at these, you can see like, well, they're all different. So each of them you could consider as a separate task of its own, but there are also common elements in them. So if you look at several of these, there are a couple of them that, have, that involve counting. So which mother bird has six babies involves counting and which tank has more fish involves counting, but they involve counting in different ways. Uh, there's also reasoning about properties, like, well, what's a, what's a baby or what's uh, on a picture uh, or which animal eats meat or which animals do not have hooves. So this reasoning about properties. And what we can do is try to sort of dissect these individual little mini tasks into, well, what, what component skills are there? So um, if we want to do a more fish task, we can of course create a model that just does that task. We can also say like, well, maybe that is a composition of a count goal and a goal that can dis that decides whether something is more than something else. And um, maybe it also invo involves reasoning about certain attributes of the fish. I guess this is a, I, what I modeled is which tank has more red fish. I guess that's a sort of slightly different question. So if we can do this kind of analysis to, 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 to split up tasks into sort of component skills, maybe we can learn something about that. And also maybe we can model situations in which people do different things. Now, this is of course, uh, well, this, this is not a, I actually created all these models that you see here and you have models that perform these tasks, but of course it's, we cannot connect these to data because we don't have uh, data on these, uh, on, on performing these tasks. So let's move to sort of testing these ideas in a, a couple of different experimental paradigms. Um, so the first paradigm I want to look at is the so-called 
rapid instructed task learning experiments or riddle tasks. Uh, and the idea has been uh, coined by Matthew Cole and his colleagues. And here you see uh, an example of one of these experiments. And the key idea in these experiments is that we give subjects in these experiments a new task on every trial. So normally in standard experiments, people do the same thing all the time. But here we are going to look at an experiment where they receive novel instructions on each trial. Uh, so how is this done? Uh, and this picture sort of illustrates that they get instructions and the instructions consist of three words. So the instruction might be same, sweet, left index. So they see that for uh, some time and then at some point they get two stimuli and they have to sort of translate the instructions into a sort of procedure that they carry out on the two words that they then see. So same sweet left index is translated into if the answer to is it sweet is the same for both words, then press your left index finger. So in this case, we would say, uh, okay, grape is sweet, apple is sweet, so we have to press the left index finger. And the instruction is also that if you, if if the if the answer is no, you have to press the the right your right index finger. So you have to press another finger. Uh, so here's a, a second example in the task two: uh, second loud, right middle. Then that translates into if the answer is is it loud, is yes for the second word, then press your right middle finger. So here you have to ignore the leaf and say, okay, dynamite is loud. So we press the right middle finger. Uh, and for each of these three instruction words, there can be three different tasks or four different tasks. So they're the same, they're second, and they're two others. There are four possible attributes like sweet, loud, and two others. And the four possible fingers that you can press. So that means there are 64 different tasks. Of course, they're not completely different from one another, but uh, they require some sort of, say, mental reconfiguration every time you see one. So just to uh, pay, see whether you all paid attention, let me, let's look at an example. Just one loud left middle. middle. So you, I, I give you all a couple of seconds to sort of mentally prepare for you for the stimulus. Just one loud left middle. And now the fixation cross comes up and here are the stimuli, drums and mice. And uh, what finger are we going to press? Well, of course, that now I have an, an, an audience that <laughs> cannot uh, show the answer, but uh, you can say, well, it's just one. Uh, well, drums are loud, mice are, well, uh, not loud. Let's say they're not loud. So we have to press the, the right middle finger. Was that the right middle? Just left middle. I already forgot the right instruction. So that's that's what people need to do then. Um, so this, uh, of course, this uh, experiment is ideal for dissecting it into skills because people have to recombine these things in order to perform the task. So we build a model of this by saying, okay, what are the skills you need? You need a skill for deciding same, just one, second or not second. Those are the four, as you could say, logical operations. And you have to connect them to other skills. And one skill is to test for an attribute, is the, the attribute sweet or the attribute loud. And then we need a skill that, that pushes the button, the, 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 the right finger or uses the right fingers to push buttons. And for every trial, we need to sort of reconfigure ourselves to do the appropriate thing. Uh, so we cannot expect people to cough up in the few seconds they need to do this, uh, a, a whole set of production rules or operations to do this. They have to already use, you could say, some ready-made pieces and connect them together. So for, and, and this is what I would call a skill level model, where we, we're, we're assuming people already have the right operations to judge whether something is the same or not and to test attributes and to push buttons. They just need to reconnect those in a novel way. And you can think about it as, so an analogy would be language. What we do with language is also that we recombine words in novel ways to create new meaning. And that's what we do here with skills. We recombine them in novel ways to create new tasks that we've never done before. 
So for uh, this, this particular task, we would say, okay, this is the little memory structure that we need to create, that we need to prepare for if we have the same suite left index uh, instruction. We need to say, okay, we have to, we, have, we have to make a same judgment. What is it that we need to do this same judgment on? On something where we determine attributes. And in this case, it's, it's, it's instantiated with suite. And then we have a yes response and a no response. And the yes response is to press the left index finger or to press the right index finger. And same is, is, a, is a sort of more general skill that we could compare, connect to completely different things than motor skills or determining attributes. So it's a reusable component that could be useful for other things as well. But here we use it for this particular exper experimental task. And you could say this is sort of one shot learning. We, we just built this thing in our memories and then we can do the task. Uh, now, in order to do this as a complete model, we, it's, it looks like this. So it's a whole Christmas tree of, uh, of skills here. So all these, these pentagons are skills. We have uh, the, the skills for, uh, for the judging whether something is the same, for whether it's just one, for check second and negate second. Those are the four logical operations. And then we have re yeah, responding by pressing with fingers and determining attributes and all these little other circles you see here are the operations that make up this, this particular skill. And then of course we need to interpret this instruction which is a little, little separate subskill in itself that probably I haven't really properly modeled yet because that a lot, a lot requires a lot more understanding. So this is a whole, yeah, and, and of course I could go into a lot of detail about these, uh, how, what these skills are like, but I really like to keep a sort of, uh, well, yeah, a global view because that's also the idea about skills. We're not really concerned about what these skills are made up from uh, uh, as long as we can do it, as long as we can implement it. So um, as a sort of testable, a first test of, well, this is a, does this approach work? Uh, I modeled uh, some data by Cole and colleagues where they gave people a limited time to study these instructions. So they got the three words that made up the instruction and uh, they had either 1100, 1900 or 2700 milliseconds to study the instruction. And then they got the stimuli and they had to respond within 1500 milliseconds. So the idea is that if you have properly prepared yourself for the task, you can make a response within 1500 milliseconds, but if you're not prepared yet, you'll probably make a mistake. And this is what you can see here in the data. So if we look at the red line, so those are the novel stimuli, the novel instructions, then you can see if you if you give people 1100 milliseconds, they're, they only have a 55% accuracy. And note that there are only two fingers you can press, so the there's a, that's, that's just above chance level that they respond. Uh, but as, as they get more time, their, their accuracy goes up. And you can also see that they like looked at self-paced. That's when you can study the instructions as long as you want. And, and then people are, are reasonably accurate, although, although they, can, they still make some mistakes. And in this experiment, they compared two conditions. One, what the novel instruction, so they get an instruction, a combination of the three words that they have never seen before. But they also sometimes get uh, instructions that they have seen very often already. So it's called practice here, but they're, they're not aware that it's something that they've seen before, but it just happens to be something that they've seen already multiple times. And you can see that if they, if, if they have to do a task that they've done multiple times, they are more accurate. So that's, uh, that was our challenge to model this. Um, and the challenge is uh, how can you build this little memory structure within the allotted time, the 1100 milliseconds or the 1800 milliseconds or the 2700 milliseconds. I think that, those were the times. And um, we did that by modeling. Uh, we, we were assuming that the model ac accumulates reusable building blocks when it, has to do this task. So initially it has to build up this whole structure, but maybe at some point it already has the building block determine attribute suite ready. So it, it can reuse the determine attribute suite part even with a different logical operation. And of course, if 
if the task is, is completely the same, it can, it can retrieve this whole structure from memory, assuming it hasn't decayed very much. Uh, so that is the basis for this model. We said like, okay, we, we, the people gradually build up these building blocks and that makes them fast enough to build this within this very limited time. May I just very briefly inject here, Niels? Yeah, sure. Just for those who are not uh, uh, so well accustomed to the notion of a cognitive architecture, it is important to point out that in cognitive architectures, the program, the, the environment in which the program executes, is uh, uh, bound by uh, uh, um, uh, uh, by, by uh, a certain characteristics of human performance. So the architecture cannot execute as quickly as you want. And it's also, on the other hand, it is not a subject to uh, uh, the particular uh, uh, abilities of the particular hardware on which you happen to be running your models. Uh, so for instance, also in Ektar, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, one, one, one typical uh, element is a fixed cycle time at which uh, uh, operations are carried out. And maybe Niels, you can spend just very, very briefly uh, 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 characterize uh, uh, what the situation is in prims in terms of- Right, yeah, so 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 good question, good question. Yeah, so so we, uh, this is always the risk if you if you if you are so intimately yeah, yeah, knowledge no, about the thing you're doing and you're, uh, you're right. don't realize your audience is not that knowledge. So the idea is that, uh, and this is, so in the Prims architecture actually borrows a lot of concepts from Nectar. And one of the things is that mental operations take time. So recalling something from memory takes time because items in memory have a certain activation and this activation determines how much time it takes to recall it. So what, uh, so what we need to do here in this particular um, task is we have to recall elements. So we have to build up this memory structure that, are, that is shown on this slide, but we, but we, we have to, to get pieces from memory and then we have to, to glue them together into a new structure. And, and, and ACT-R has, and, and Prims by inheritance from ACT-R has, uh, has a theory about how much time that takes. So how much time does it take to recall something from memory? How much time does it take to build one of these little memory nodes? And, um, and those are at some point hard constraints. So you cannot say, well, this is something we can build in half a second. No, that's, that's not something that is possible then. So we have to abide, you could say, by the underlying rules that we have determined about what memory is like. So again, here we see the, the different layers of this architecture that at the layer of the skills, we're not uh, looking at sort of these pr more primitive mechanisms of, of memory activation, but because those happen on a lower level, they still affect us. So if we say like, we want to build this memory structure, the underlying levels tell us, well, this takes time. And here, and, the, and we can make mistakes. We can have misretrievals of memory. We can have memory, mis memory fa faults. And, uh, and eventually this helps us make, make predictions. Um, and again, if, if uh, please also for other members of the audience, please, uh, um, please interrupt me if things become really unclear. Um, see, oh. I, I'll, I've just opened up the meeting chat thing that, so I can also keep an, an eye on that. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the show. <laughs> yes, I see. Uh, so, so there's a question from uh, Irina, I see whether this translates about multiple modalities, so visual versus audio input. Um, now, the model doesn't really make a distinction here between visual and audio input, but the underlying architecture does. So uh, we've done many multitasking experiments where it really matters what the input modality is because we can more or less process visual and, and auditory information in parallel under certain circumstances, but not under all circumstances. But I guess that's a whole whole different different story. Um, okay, maybe back to this particular model. Uh, so we build this memory structure. If we are ready for it, the, the architecture can give a correct answer, but maybe the architecture is too slow the, and, uh, and then the model predicts that the, the, mo the model will also make a mistake. So we can... Uh, 
Um, yeah, this is actually what I already told you. So here is something that comes out of the model where we where we have the data. Uh, so those are the uh, the dash no the the solid lines, and this is a run of the model uh, with the with the dashed lines. Now you can see here this is not a perfect model fit. Uh, and actually, I haven't in the in the end not really tried to tweak parameters until I uh, get a completely accurate fit of the data. But in a certain in a sense, I, I don't really care about a very precise fit here because the number of data points is is not very large. But the main thing that it has, that that it shows is that we can actually model this kind of carryover from one task to another, and that we can can have an explanation of how we build up representations for new tasks. But this is the first demonstration where, where this is an experimental paradigm that um, we managed to model. But we have a more general agenda. So the more general agenda is to say, like, can, can we maybe start building, a, you could say, a sort of general per skill lab, general purpose skill library. So we have, all, we have a whole library of skills and then we have a new, and when we have a new experiment, we can say, well, we don't, we're not going to build up a model from scratch. No, we, we're looking at our skill library and pull a, pull a couple of skills out and say like, well, we, we instantiate these together and that gives us a model of this new task because that's what people do. If you put them in an experiment, they generally, you give them instruction and they can immediately do the task. It's not that they have to completely figure out from scratch how to do it. Sometimes that is the case. There's some experiments where people really have to figure out how to do them. Uh, if you're familiar with the NBEC task, that's sort of a working memory task, you might, and you've ever been a, you've ever, you've tried out that task, you might have figured, you, you might know that you really need to figure out a strategy for that. And that is sometimes the case that we actually have to learn something new from the bottom up. But in many situations, we don't need to do that. We, we, know, we get an instruction and we know what to do. So let's look at very traditional cognitive psychology example, working memory. And this is something that my PhD student, Corne Hoekstra, has worked on. And also together with my, uh, my colleague, Sander Martens, who is really an expert on uh, the task we are, we are eventually going to look at. Uh, so. You can think about working memory as this sort of capacity thing, like seven plus or minus two, but it's actually pretty naive. And uh, if you look at memory processes, there's often uh, you will read about chunking information. That if we have to remember a couple of unrelated things, we make little chunks in our in our memory. But this chunking idea is not always applicable. So you can say like, well, if I if I just look at how how can you store memory in, in your long term memory, you can do it in chunks where you group things together or you can do it separate. So if we look at memory experiments where people have to memorize numbers, then often they do some sort of chunking. So here is a this is actually my office phone number. Uh, and this is chunked up in three pieces, the area code for Groningen, the, uh, the uh, digits for the three numbers that signify it's a university phone number 363, and then 6435, that's just my office. And that's three chunks. And people who know Groningen or who know the university are perfect at chunking this. But even people who have to memorize longer numbers have a tendency to build these, to chunk these. But chunking is not always possible. And uh, in psychology, often we study complex working memory tasks where we give people one piece of information they have to memorize, and then they have to do something else. And then we give them another piece and they, let them do something else. So they just get the little pieces of information that they have to memorize in between other things. So chunking is not really an option there. So they, or at least putting things together. So the only way to do that is to put everything in separate chunks. And if you look at models of working memory, so there, there are tons of actar models on memory tasks that sometimes people opt for a chunking strategy and sometimes they opt for a separate chunk strategy. And um, so Cornet said like, well, or, or in the project with Cornet, we said like, okay, let's make these separate skills. We have a, a chunking skill and we have a separate chunking skill. 
and people pick the right skill if for the appropriate task. So if we have a simple working memory task where you have to just memorize a number, then uh, we can apply the chunking strategy. That's sort of the obvious strategy to use. So if you see four, two, nine, uh, and then a pause, and then six, seven, two, and then another pause, then people will probably chunk these as four, two, nine, one chunk, seven, six, seven, two, and then another chunk. And if they, if they have to reproduce it, they will just recall these separate chunks. And indeed, there's lots of experimental evidence that people actually do this. So if you look at the little graph at the bottom uh, in the data, that's the solid line. If, the, if people reproduce a, in this case, a nine digit sequence, they do this by, and that's the reaction times, so they cuff up the first three, first three digits, then there's a little pause, then the second three digits, there's a little pause, and then the third three, three digits. So when people have to reproduce this number, they already, you already see pauses in their reaction times, which is generally considered as evidence for a chunking strategy. So Cornet implemented this as three strategies, a, a couple of skills, a reading skill, a consolidate chunk skill, and a retrieve skill, and a report skill. So. That's what, how he uh, modeled that. Uh, so then he went to a, a complex working memory task where you see a digit and then you have to do something else. So judging whether a word is a noun or an adjective. And here the assumption is that the most likely working memory strategy is to consolidate these separate instead of chunking them together because you have to do stuff in between which makes this chunking very hard. Uh, actually impossible in, if, if you follow the rules of the of the cognitive architecture. Um, and so he creates the model of that. And so uh, we, we'd consolidate separate and of course also the skill that, that decides on noun or adjective. And he molded a different experiment with that where, where the, the, the memory size, so the number of digits that you had to uh, recall in the end was uh, was uh, manipulated and you can see here that we that his model follows the data reasonably well as well so now we have a couple of components and he also made a model of visual search so i'm not de detailing that here and now we can say okay we have a bunch of skills now can we combine these skills into a new task and the task that uh, we are we're looking at is attentional blink and what we're going to do is we're going to model this new task only using things we've already used for for separate for other tasks so we're not introducing anything new just taking the pills pieces we have and we're going to put them together in a novel way so what is attentional blink uh, it's uh, a task where you see a very rapid stream of stimuli and uh, most of the stimuli are digits but it's your task to report the letters in there and I'm, I'm just, this is probably not going to work through an online setting because the, the stream is a hundred milliseconds per item you see, but I'm going to try nevertheless. So your task is to see what the, dig, what the letters are in between the digits. So on my screen, this was perfectly, a perfectly fast stream with a hundred milliseconds per item, but I'm not sure okay. whether this actually worked for you. <laughs> I managed to see a J. <laughs> a J. So that's well. Then, then you show the perfect attentional blink because that's <laughs> what you what people do. They only see the J and they miss the K. <laughs> but maybe others have seen the K uh, because of uh, yeah internet lag. Uh, but uh, the stream could, is really rapid. It's a hundred milliseconds per. But per could you give it just one more try? I mean, we are not trying to be perfectly scientific. All right. I'll, I'll thank you for your time. Oh yeah. <laughs> so perhaps you saw the J in the case, so perhaps you, but this was supposed to be a very, very fast stream. Yeah. So interesting enough, the, what, what the interesting thing is in Central Blink is that you see the first letter most of the time, uh, but most of the time you don't see the second letter. But this only happens if the first and the second target are about two to 400 milliseconds apart. So there's, there is between one and three distractors in between. But if there's more time in between, you'll probably be able to report both letters. 
But if they're right next to each other, so you just see J and then immediately K, then most of the time people also are able to report both. And this is sort of the big mystery of attentional blink. And many people have, people have made many models of this, but they made models as if this is a task that's already hardwired in our brains, which is of course a ridiculous idea because this is the, maybe for some of you, the first time you saw this task and nevertheless, you were able to do this right away. It's not something that requires a lot of instruction. People can do this right away. They're not getting better at it when they do this more often. So uh, it's not reasonable to think that we already are hardwired to do attentional blink. So we need to find a different explanation. And of course the explanation is we have to use our existing skills to build a new skill, a, a new task representation for attentional blink. Oh, that's it one more time. <laughs> okay. so. Uh, we were going to reuse pieces from the task that Corneille already modeled before. So we had a complex work in memory task that had uh, a, the lexical decision skills that were needed for the complex work in memory task. We don't need those. We have single item chunking and we have reporting. Then we have visual, a visual search task. Well, I actually didn't show that, but uh, visual search has a, a moving attention around the screen and also identify whether something is a target. Um, so what we can do is say, well, we build a model of attentional blink and we're going to reuse the identify skill of the visual search task because we have to identify whether or not something is a target, a letter and not a digit. And then we're going to do single item chunking. So every item we're going to um, store separately in our memory. And of course we need to report the, the digits eventually. Now, most people don't consider attentional blink as a working memory task because uh, the span is only two that is trivial but here we're still going to see this as a as a, as using working memory as part of the task now if we create a model of attentional blink using these three components then this is the result so you can see here the task uh, you see this rapid stream so this uh, the, in these example the t and the a are the two targets so if we look at the skills that we're using, well, first we're looking for targets. That's the, the active skill. Then there's a first target and we see the T. And now we're going to consolidate as a separate item in memory. Now, ECTAR dictates that memory consolidation takes time. Actually, they have a pretty solid prediction on that. It takes 200 milliseconds, which means that within these 200 milliseconds, we're going to miss the second target, the A. And then we start looking for targets again, but there will be no more targets. And then we retrieve and report. And in this case, we would only report this, the first digit. Now here, the graph below, you can see the typical experimental results. And this is the, um, the results where we look, uh, uh, the lag is sort of the distance between the first and the second target. So if they're right next to each other, that's the data point on the left, then the accuracy is pretty high. It goes down to two to when, when, when there's a, and a distractor in between. And then it gradually goes up uh, as there's more distance between the two targets. And you can see here that the model uh, does a very good job at modeling the data, even though this model is just made out of components of different tasks. So you can say, well, attentional blink is not a limitation of our cognitive system. It is just a choice of the wrong working memory strategy. Because if we choose the right working memory strategy, and it's this diagram, if we, if we say, well, we're going to do, we, if we pick the chunking strategy as opposed to the, uh, the separate chunk strategy, then there's no attentional blink. And you might say, okay, but why, why don't people do that? Why don't they pick the right strategy? And we think it's due to the instructions. The instructions say, well, report the, the items, there's stuff in between. So people sort of automatically pick the wrong strategy. So is it possible to push people to the right strategy? And indeed this is possible. So uh, what you see here as data in the graph is actually from an experiment where people receive a different instruction. So it, the instruction is not report the letters, but the instruction is report the syllable that's in the stream. So in this case, you have to, would have to report ta, 
And the instruction of, re of reporting a syllable sort of prompts the chunking strategy as opposed to this separate strategy. So, and you can see here that this is a very powerful ma manipulation and, it, and, and that means that, um, uh, and, and there are other sort of experimental manipulations in which you can make the attentional blink effect go away. So uh, here you can see that by using this particular paradigm of skills, we can explain things about attentional blink that other models cannot explain because they never consider building, building up a model out of components from other tasks. Okay, I'm looking at the time. I see that I'm, I've used up my 45 minutes. And of course, I don't want to keep no one's complaining <laughs> from dinner. <laughs> So I want to, well, I have a final example, but I, I want to go over this very quickly because as I said, sure. I don't want to keep it from dinner. Uh, yeah, right, but don't rush it because it, it, it would be a loss anyway, so. Yeah, so, I, and I agree with you, rushing rushing the last bit of your talk that you're desperate in trying to present is also not a good idea. Exactly. So I briefly I want to look at another sort of system uh, because, because I, in, in the start of my talk, I talked about systems, right? That, that psychologists sometimes want to look at, well, what is the system behind it? And then the, sometimes they don't look at sort of alternatives. So uh, one other prime example where people look at systems is executive control. Um, now you want to, so what is executive control? And this is actually a big, super vague concept in, in cognitive psychology. Uh, but it's sort of the idea, like, how, how do we control our mission? So you might already say, like, interpreting instructions is a form of executive control because we have to reconfigure ourselves to do a particular task. Um, but this is very broad, and that's also something that often in, in cognitive psychology we don't like. So we want to try to, to reduce it to its essence. So there's been lots of experiments that people associate with executive control. And uh, uh, Miyake has already done a, a huge individual differences study on co executive control. And he said like, well, there's three main factors in executive control. And he called them shifting, updating, and inhibition. So shifting is often uh, is associated with something called task switching in, um, in cognitive psychology. And that's the idea that if you change from one task to another, there's a cost involved. So if you do one task and now you have to do something else, it, it, there's a cost in that. And we've seen something like that in the rapid instruction task learning that indeed we have to, if you have to prepare for a new task, there is a cost involved because you have to build up this memory structure. So that's one element of, of executive control. The second element of executive control is updating. And this is associated with anything related to working memory. So not just this idea of capacity, but also deciding what, what are things that we need to store in declarative memory and maybe also deciding what, what the right strategy is. And the third element of cognitive executive control is inhibition. Uh, that means that we have a couple of sort of automated tendencies and sometimes we have to suppress automated tendencies because we have to do something else. And the prototypical example of that is the Stroop task where you see the word red, but it's in green ink. So you have to say green and not red because, and normally our tendency is to read words and not to reason about the color of the ink because that's normally irrelevant. And that means we have to inhibit our tendency to read a word and we have to focus on the real thing we need to do, which is name the color of the ink. And so Miyake has done, a, a big experiment in which uh, hundreds of, of subjects had to do all these nine tasks. And he did a complicated statistical analysis in, in, on this, where he said like, well, these are the three factors that are in there. And you can, um, um, but then the tendency is to think like, oh, maybe we have systems for shifting, updating and inhibition. And, and maybe that is, maybe, maybe there is, there is some component of that, but we also have to think about it. Maybe this is also related to strategy. So, um, we, well, we, first of all, we, we did a big experiment ourselves of Miyaki's, trying to replicate Miyaki with, heavy, well, with eight tasks of, uh, of where we had th three tasks or two tasks for, in, for inhibition for each of these different factors. Uh, well, we, 
this was not the best experiment. In the end, we didn't have enough subjects. So here you can see some correlations. They're not perfect. Actually, the Aki has much better, uh, better results, but we wanted our, some data of ourselves. So here you could see the green correlations related to task switching and the yellow uh, re correlations related to uh, working memory and the, the, the orange related to inhibition. And it's not this is not a perfect experimental results, but at least we had some data to play with. So we never published these data because we're not happy with them, uh, but at least we, we had some basis for this. Could you just very briefly explain yeah. the task seven, the anti-saccade? Uh, yeah, so anti-saccade, it's typically people see a fixation, see um, they're primed by an arrow. So maybe an arrow to the left. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, but so they expect a stimulus to appear on the left side of the screen uh, and it will appear there most of the time, but sometimes it appears on the right side of the screen. Right. So it's, it's so uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure whether I actually tell the right experiment here because this is a, this is a wild bit where we did this, but it's considered a typical inhibition experiment where you tend to want to move your eyes to where arrows point, but sometimes you have to do the, 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 the diff a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, so not a, but we also saw some interesting correlations where the Stroop task also correlated with uh, task switching, which is sort of well, sort of we could say out of factor mm -hmm. uh, uh, effects. So uh, my student Corne again made models of all these tasks, and uh, and of course there's lots of lots of models because eight models and and eight results. So he has lots of graphs. So I definitely not pasted all these graphs in my presentation here, but here's just a, an example of how he tried to have this. These are the three uh, working memory tasks. So he tried to model these by, again, dissecting them into skills like an updating skill, a response skill, and a read skill, and some sometimes a, a, some specific skills for the task. So again, he did the exercise that we also did the detentional blinker. So like, well, can we explain all these not nine tasks with a limited subset of tasks uh, or skills. So that's what he did here. And then he showed that he could make fits of individual individual tasks. So here just uh, again, these three working memory tasks where he could uh, obtain good fits of the data, at least the data that we collected. Um, uh, so keeping track had uh, had some uh, he could fit the data there letter memory and and spatial two back where uh, well he could sort of fit a sort of particular aspects of the task but these are not really important because it's not about modeling individual tasks we want to see can we also explain individual differences and then you can look at correlations between model performance on these all these different models. So here we, we can make the same matrix as uh, as on the experiments. And here you can see that indeed, uh, we have much higher correlations than in the actual experimental data because the only individual difference between the models is how well they perform on these skills. And obviously with real subjects, there's a lot more going on than just these skills. But you can see here that within these different factors that Miyaki identified, we have very high correlations. and. In between them, um, most of the time, we don't have any correlations at all, but except here with this, with the Stroop task again, and the Stroop task and the task switching. So that, that was the same thing we saw on the data. Um, now, this is all not perfect research yet. Uh, that, of course, you can, there's, there's, you can point at methodological issues with the experimental data. Uh, uh, but I think the main lesson here is not so much like how how exactly are we fitting data? But the, the main thing is that we are modeling, um, we're modeling something that people think, that most psychologists would think about as systems using learned skills. And I think skills are sort of a powerful alternative to systems because human cognition is extremely flexible. Uh, we, we are, able to do novel tasks all the time and that i think most of the time most of the day we are doing novel things and that is a flexibility that is much, that we can explain a lot better with skills than with systems 
and it's also a much better way to explain individual differences because you can explain different individual differences by saying, well, maybe some, some people don't have particular skills or they use their skills in a different way because maybe between individuals, the, diff the, the particulars of their skills are also different. And um, well, one of the things we start to do is use this concept of skills to look at education, to sort of think like, well, if, if, if students have to master a new domain, they have to acquire the necessary skills for that domain, but they may also need skills that are more general, maybe, uh, maybe particular reading skills that are necessary for mathematics or uh, particular general reasoning skills for say a logic course. Uh, so I think that that perspective is really useful in, in also in application that we, we start looking into that.